the, the only way forward. Um, talk a little bit about why this is important. I'm sure most of you have seen some graph that looks somewhat like this. The red line there is the global IPv4 free pool. In February, it hit the bottom, and uh, there is no more IPv4 in the global free pool. Um, a couple of months later, in April, APNIC ran out of IPv4 addresses, so they're now into their austerity policy, dribbling out uh, slash 22s once to uh, each member that asks for one. The, uh, the current state of the free pools a few months ago, Aaron's actually down to about six slash eights now, not 7.75. Um, I expect Aaron will run out around September of next year if things don't change. I expect things will change and that'll probably pull in a little bit. Uh, Afrinic and Lacnic still have a while to go. Ripe, I expect, will probably run out somewhere between March and May of next year. Um, this is all assuming that we don't get any run on the bank behavior like we did towards the end of the AP Nick free pool. As you know, IANA ran out first. The regional internet registries started running out in April. End user providers are going to start running out shortly thereafter. How many of you think that there's nobody on the internet without v4 today? Excellent. Everybody realizes that there are actually people on the internet that can't get IPv4 addresses today. Indeed, I do business with some people in, in Asia that cannot get IPv4 addresses, and they are v6 only. Their, their perspective of the internet is very limited because all they can get to is what's on v6 and nothing else. So if you think this isn't real, think again. It's happening. It's happening now. They don't even have access to a 6 to 4 translator? Nope. Well, a 6 to 4 isn't a translator. It's, an encapsula it's a, a way to shove 6 through the 4 network. No, I mean... The you mean a NAT 6-4? Yeah, that's... Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work particularly well for them and it doesn't, doesn't handle most of the services they care about. So all, all of the people that think NAT will save our bacon, wrong. Yes. Um, that's, so, that's NAT. Yeah, exactly. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So let's talk about how ready we are. Some things are actually pretty thoroughly ready. Most of the backbones have implemented v6 uh, at the backbone level. A lot of the cable modem systems are, are on DOCSIS 3 and they're ready for v6. Uh, Mac OS has been ready for v6 since 10.4. 10.7 offers some pretty big improvements to their v6 capabilities. Uh, Linux, the 2.6 kernels do a pretty good job with v6. The 2.4 kernels had some v6 support. Uh, Windows 7 and Windows 2008 uh, mostly support v6. XP is somewhat limited. Um, Windows 7 does v6 as well as it does v4. And I'll leave that to your judgment as how good that is. Uh, YMAX, the specification is there. The head-end equipment mostly is OK. Uh, there's some support in LTE. Uh, there's very limited support in some customer premise equipment. Uh, there's a lot of early adopters and industry experts that are ready. Hurricane Electric is fully dual stack everywhere, and I'm even fully dual stacked at my house. So, things that aren't ready. This is the bad news. Pond systems, DSL systems, everybody that's still running DOCSIS 2, WDS, EVDO, HSPA, and WiMAX, you know, most of those handheld things we carry. Uh, older Windows, XP and earlier, embedded systems, printers, home entertainment and home electronics, consumer premise equipment, and most of the IT staff and management in the world are not particularly ready for IPv6. And the worst part of it all for this conference, most VoIP systems are not really ready for v6. Um, there's even, you know, relatively limited support in asterisk. Last I heard, the IAX protocol won't run over v6 yet. I walked around the, uh, the show floor last night and I talked to as many of the uh, uh, product vendors that would interact with the network as I could. And these are the answers I got, ranging from IPv what on the uh, shame side of the slide. So you guys know who you are. Uh, to the fame side of the slide where FreePBX and Yealink basically uh, got the best answer. They said, of course it supports V6 all across the board. Everything. So kudos to those guys. Uh, Audio Codes got me a good answer this morning that said uh, most of their products already support V6 and they're going to uh, have the rest in uh, very soon. Cisco said, yeah, we've got this mandate we're sort of trying to meet uh, somewhere around Q1, Q2 of next year, but I don't know if we'll make it or not and our developers are really upset about it and blah, blah, blah. Um, Panasonic's reaction at first was, um, you know, no, we don't do the V6, it's not necessary. 
And when I pointed out where this was going, they said, well, actually, we've got it on our roadmap for sometime next year. <laughs> so, you know, you have to push them a little bit. Um, but that's th those are the answers I got. Uh, Polycom does have some V6 support in some of their video end systems, but none of their telephony stuff has V6 support yet. So that's where they are. Digium Asterisk does support V6, but their commercial products, Switchbox and uh, the hardware stuff, uh, the appliances do not. So that's why they're over on the shame side of the slide. Okay, so I'm gonna do a quick survey here. How many of you have started planning your V6 deployments in your organization? Okay, that's, that's good. How many of you have V6 running at least in a test environment? Come on in and sit down, guys, we don't bite. Okay. How many of you have started deploying production V6 in your organization? Okay. Does your house count? Uh, I'd rather talk about your job site, but yeah, your house uh, counts a little bit. I got one of, one of my customers already got it deployed, but I'm okay. a consultant, so kind of. Fair kind enough. Of moving them. Yep. Okay. How many of you have full production dual stack everywhere? Yay, we're getting some hands. This is progress. Okay. So here's what it looks like in most of the other rooms I present to. Average, I get about 7% that say they're planning. Way too low. Test environment, that drops to about 3%. By the time I get to deploying, I get between one and five hands. We had about 10 or 12 here. So that's, that's good. You guys are actually a little bit ahead of the game. And in terms of full production, I'm usually the only one left standing. This time we had a couple of hands in the audience. So we're doing, we're doing good, but we have to do better. If you're not planning your V6 deployment already, you really need to ask yourself why not. I mean, this is gonna hit you like a freight train if you're not ready for it. Uh, if you're deploying, keep moving. If you're in full production, start helping your neighbors. We gotta get this done. This is a collective effort. We're all gonna sink or swim together. The internet is like walkie talkies. You can have the best walkie talkie on the planet, but if it's on a frequency nobody else can use, it doesn't do you any good. Okay, we gotta get everybody onto V6, not just you. I was in Amsterdam last week, and in addition to having my laptop stolen, I learned a little Dutch. Um, I learned that in Dutch, the term nat means wet. And I thought that that was pretty apropos to the way it works on the internet, because really, nat dampens the user experience. It makes for a very watered down version of what the internet can do. And the more you nat, the more watered down, the weaker the internet becomes because it's harder to troubleshoot, it costs more, and it reduces security because it's nearly impossible to correlate audit trails. So I think Lal Kitty said it best, more, IPv NAT, more IPv4 NAT, are you kidding me? So we're in a shared network, okay, which means we've got kind of a shared fate. I hear a lot of people tell me, I don't need IPv6, I've got IPv4 addresses to last me for years to come. But are you really on the internet just to talk to yourself? Because if not, then your addresses aren't the only ones that matter. There simply aren't enough addresses for everybody that wants or needs one to be on the internet in IPv4. If you wanna be able to reach new participants, that's gonna require IPv6. There are already users on the internet, as I said, that cannot get full access to IPv4. And the workarounds all come with some pretty bad trade-offs. So the real questions everybody needs to be asking themselves, and you need to think about these, I'm not asking for answers right now, how many of you think your organization is gonna be fully IPv6 ready by February of next year? Because that's when it's gonna to start to actually feel like the internet is reducing its scope in IPv4. If you're not ready, what do you plan to do to fix that? And how do you plan to cope with a world where there are no more IPv4 addresses available? How do you plan to cope with a world where some of your customers can only get to you on IPv6, or worst case, they have IPv4, but it's severely degraded because it's going through multiple layers of NAT and protocol translation and all these other things. So it really boils down to which of these two approaches will you take? You can join this nice lady at the beach with her great running dual stack network, everything's fine. Or you can join Mr. Ostrich over in the African Outback and uh, you know think IPv4 is just fine, we just need more NAT. So now let's talk about how to get there. We're gonna talk about some of the basics of IPv6. We'll talk a little bit about how to do IPv6 addressing, configuring IPv6 native on Linux, 
how to do IPv6 without a native backbone, getting IPv6 services for free because a lot of people like free stuff. We'll also talk a little bit about routing, firewalls, DNS, troubleshooting, and staff training. Any questions before I get into the basics of IPv6? Okay, so real simple, 32 bits versus 128 bits, vastly larger numbers. Uh, the unicast address space in IPv4 was about 3.7 billion unicast addresses. In IPv6 from the current um, reserved unicast slash three that IANA has uh, received from the IETF, there are 42 plus undecillion addresses. Anybody want to take a guess at how many zeros in an undecillion? Bueller? 42. Close. A little lower. Did I hear 32? 32. Yeah, a little higher. 36. 36 zeros in an, in an undecillion. Okay, so imagine 42 followed by 36 zeros and, you know, add some change into that. And that's how many IPv6 addresses are in the first one-eighth of the address space. 297 undecillion addresses held in reserve at the IETF. Uh, the most prevalent network size in IPv4 was the slash 24. That could accommodate 254 devices. Um, in the IPv6 world, that's a slash 64. Anybody want to take a gander at how many hosts you can put on a slash 64? I'll give you a hint. The simple answer is not a number. All of them. Okay, a slash 64 is the square of the total size of the IPv4 internet. <laughs> you can put more hosts on a slash 64 than your switch will handle. So by being able to give every subnet a slash 64, we get to stop counting hosts. Okay, no more of this, let's see, I've got six hosts, I can put that in a 29. Oh shoot, I've got seven, I have to give it a 28, but God, that wastes so many addresses. We don't have to do that anymore. Now we just say, okay, we need a subnet. We put it a slash 64. It'll grow, it'll shrink, whatever. It'll hold all the hosts it needs to. Move on. No more counting hosts. Nice, huh? So notation's a little bit different. You're all familiar with the dotted decimal quads here uh, for IPv4. In uh, IPv6, we have what are called hexadecimal quads, which are groups of four hex digits. I've also heard the term hextet. Um, I've heard the term um, chomp because, you know, a nibble is half a byte is half a, a word is half a chomp or something like that. Um, but hexadecimal quads is the official IETF term. Um, in IPv4, we can shorten it by suppressing the leading zeros in each uh, group. In IPv6, we suppress leading zeros per quad, but we can also take out multiple quads that contain nothing but zeros and collapse them with a double colon. Okay, only one double colon per address, however. If you use two double colons, we don't know how many zeros to put in for each double colon, so it gets too ambiguous. So I've been looking for graphic ways to explain the difference in size to people, and this is the best one I've found so far. If you think of an IPv4 slash 24 as being a large bag of almond M&Ms, which, yes, I did count them once, does contain roughly 254 M&Ms, a slash 64 would contain enough almond M&Ms to literally fill the entire Great Lakes, all five Great Lakes, to the rim. Yum. Yeah. Um, so if we think of each subnet, each slash 24 as being a single M&M, then we could cover about 70 yards of a football field with one layer of M&Ms. Okay, not stacked, just one layer of M&Ms, only 70 yards. That's how many slash 24s we have in IPv4. On the other hand, we have enough slash 64s in IPv6 that each M&M representing a whole network, you know, each network being enough to fill the Great Lakes, we actually have enough networks to also fill the Great Lakes. So we have the Great Lakes full of M&Ms squared worth of addresses. Hard to visualize, but it's as close as I could come. One thing I need to warn you, do not attempt to eat a slash 64 worth of M&Ms. It will result in adverse health consequences. 18 quintillion M&Ms. Man, that's a lot of M&Ms. Okay, this is going to require some differences in our thinking. In IPv4, we thought about allocating hosts. How many hosts do I need? Size the subnet to that size. 
In IPv6, the assignment unit is the 64. We think about how many subnets do I need, not how many hosts do I need. In IPv4, we were constantly managing this trade-off between aggregation and scarcity of addresses. So we, we, we have some real weird compromises built into that. And that's why we have a 380,000 plus prefix routing table running around the internet now. In IPv6, aggregation is the, the primary concern, at least for this first one-eighth of the address space. If we burn through that faster than we expect to, i.e. in less than 50 years, we can think about a more conservative allocation policy. The address issue methodology in IPv4 was pretty much sequential slow start. So we gave you the, the smallest chunk we could give you and still meet your immediate need. And then if you needed more, we gave you more from wherever in the sequence of allocating addresses we happen to be at the time. In IPv6, we're, we're trying to do what's called bisection or binary chop, where you start out with this big pool of addresses and you put the first block in the middle. And the next block goes halfway to one end and the next block goes halfway to the other end. And you just sort of start filling in the gaps along the way until you, you know, the, the, the gaps get narrower. Um, this allows us over time as a, an allocation needs to expand, as long as there's still a gap in front of it, we just reduce the prefix length of that allocation and it fills in that remaining gap. So hopefully we don't have to change the prefix and hopefully we don't blow up the routing table with all of these repetitive allocations. NAT. In IPv4, NAT was a necessary evil, and yes, it is evil. I will happily debate that with anybody offline. Um, and it, but it was necessary for address conservation in IPv4. In IPv6, it's really not supported, though there is now an RFC for it. Um, it's not needed, and it breaks more than it solves, other than the possible use of NAT64 to support IPv6 only hosts getting access to legacy v4 resources. Ideally, those resources should move forward to v6, and that's the better solution. In terms of address configuration in IPv4, we all know how to do static addressing. We all understand IPv4 DHCP. In IPv6, we actually have a new mechanism called stateless autoconf, which I'll talk a little bit more about. We have static, you can still do it, and we have some DHCP. There is a need for, for some work in the DHCP area in v6. It's definitely not what you're used to with v4 DHCP. So if you want to use DHCP in v6, you've got some reading to do. There's a new technique in, pref in uh, v6 called DHCP prefix delegation, which promises some really cool capabilities where I can actually give a router a dynamic prefix, you know, a slash 48 or something like that, and then the router can dynamically allocate addresses further downstream or prefixes further downstream, 56s, 60s, whatever. So that's got some pretty cool potential, but it, it doesn't enjoy widespread support just yet. People are still kind of going, wow, that's really cool. What should we do with it? Um, so, but the developers are working on some cool stuff. This is an example of what happens when your IPv6 only client tries to reach your IPv4 only server. This is not a new algorithm for lossy compression. Uh, it's really just a metaphor for communication that doesn't really do anything. So, you know, this is the internet. This is the internet on IPv4 in 2012. Any questions? Okay, let's talk a little bit about address scopes. Um, these are new in v6. We didn't have them in IPv4. Link local is uh, valid only on the attached subnet. So literally, it allows hosts to talk to each other without any global configuration whatsoever, just by using the fact that their MAC addresses happen to be unique. Link local addresses all start with FE80. So if you see an IPv6 address that starts with FE80, you know that that's a link local address. A host may have the same link local address on multiple interfaces, or it may have a different link local address for each interface. But when you try to reach a remote link local host on a host that has more than one interface, even if it's a loopback and, and an ethernet, for example, so pretty much any host, you have to specify which interface you're trying to reach that remote host on because link local is reachable out every interface that's running IPv6. Um, there was a concept of site local addresses that was deprecated by the IETF some years ago. Um, they're recommending unique local addresses as a substitute. 
Uh, ULA isn't really an address scope. It's really a pathological form of global unicast that's kind of brain dead, but it's essentially the uh, IPv6 equivalent of RFC 1918. I don't really understand what you need RFC 1918 addresses for if you're not doing NAP, but uh, they're there if you need them. Um, and then of course there's the global unicast scope, which is pretty much what we're used to using. Um, currently they're being issued out of 2000 colon colon slash three, which is the range 2000 through three FFF for those that don't want to do the bit math in their head. Um, and those are the ones that are globally unique and valid in global routing tables. Stateless auto configuration. This is the easiest way to configure an IPv6 host. Click done. That's all it takes. No host configuration required. It will only learn the prefix and router information. It will not learn any services addresses such as DNS, NTP, etc. There is now a DNSRR specification for providing IPv6 uh, DNS servers to a host through the stateless autoconf process. It's relatively new, it's not widely implemented just yet, but I expect that that will solve a lot of the problems people have expressed with stateless autoconf. Um, the other problem with stateless autoconf is that it assumes all advertising routers are created equal um, within their priority scope. This means that somebody that wants to maliciously grab your traffic can advertise an, a router advertisement that is perfectly valid, and as long as they still forward your packets to the real router, it's very hard to detect that they have done so. The uh, solution to this is RA guard on switches and especially wireless access points to prevent router advertisements being sent from sources that are not routers, that are not expected to be routers. Um, this is especially important in wireless access points, for example, because imagine the guy sitting in the back of the coffee shop just sort of advertising himself as an IPv6 router, collecting everybody's traffic, passing it on to the real router, but uh, you know he can he can look at whatever's going by as it, as it goes by and enjoy the uh, the access to all that data. I personally don't want to you know hand my data to somebody sitting in the back of a coffee shop that way. So RA guard is a feature that we need. Push your vendors for it if you aren't already. Um, I've already talked about the the vulnerability. Stateless autoconf, how it works under the hood. The host uses its MAC address to produce a link local address. Usually this will start out as a 48-bit MAC address, right? We're all used to those. Um, there are actually 64-bit MAC addresses. For example, Firewire uses a 64-bit uh, MAC address. But if you start with 48 bits, it's very easy. You take your 48 bits, you separate it into two 24-bit chunks, you spread them out, and you stick FFFE in the middle. The only other thing you have to do is you take the 2-bit the of the first octet and you flip it. So if it's 0, 02, it becomes 00. zero. If it's 00, zero, it becomes 02, et cetera. Um, the next thing it'll do is it'll send out some packets to say, is anybody else using this address that I'm about to use? And if it sees anybody using that address, it will turn itself off. It will shut down IPv6 on the interface, and you will have to do something to bring IPv6 up. It will not go any further. This is actually a very good thing because in IPv4 what we do is we just assign the address to the interface and we get duplicate MAC addresses and duplicate IP addresses floating around the network and the switches fight over it and the traffic gets there sort of and it gets there some of the time and not other of the time and we see packet loss and both systems suffer and we get all kinds of degradation and we have all kinds of fun troubleshooting it because we find one system where the guy's complaining but the other system's sitting there unattended and it takes us, you know, hunting through all the switch tables and following all the cables, and then we discover that it's on a wireless access point, God knows where in the building, right? So finding that second host is always fun. With this, the first guy just keeps running, and the second guy goes down hard. It's very obvious, it's very deterministic, and guess what? Generally, a host doesn't come online unattended, right? So generally, the guy's sitting there waiting to get on the network, and he sees it break, and he complains, and you, get, you can deal with the situation right away. The good news is you're not going to have these duplicates unless you've got a duplicate MAC address. So if you've got a duplicate MAC address, you're going to have problems anyway, and this gives you a nice obvious way to solve them in one location with ease. The next thing it does is it sends out an ICMPv6 router solicitation to the all routers multicast group. 
the router will send back a unicast to that host router advertisement to its link local address in response. Periodically, these routers will also send router advertisements to the all hosts multicast group, but that's, a, that's to refresh the timers that we'll talk about in a minute. The router advertisement includes several pieces of data. It includes a list of prefixes. It includes a preference for that router, high, medium, or low. It includes a desired lifetime and a valid lifetime. The host resets the applicable lifetime counters every time it receives a valid RA containing that prefix. So if it's counting down 300, 299, 298, 297, and it gets a new RA, it'll go back to 300, 299, 298, now, if that RA contains 50, then it'll go 299, 298, 297. Oop, RA received 50, 49, 48. So you can actually deprecate prefixes faster than the lifetime timers that you initially set if you send out what's called a poisoned RA that contains a shorter lifetime. All the hosts should fairly quickly update to that new RA timer. Once the, the valid lifetime Sorry, once the desired lifetime is timed out, the host will continue to use the address, but it will not initiate new sessions using that address. So the desired lifetime is the time during which the host can initiate new sessions from that prefix. The valid lifetime is the time that the interface will keep the address configured. Once the valid lifetime expires, the address will be removed from the interface and any existing sessions will be terminated. This allows you to do graceful renumbering because you've got your, your desired and valid lifetimes. Say you've got one set for an hour, the desired lifetime set for an hour and the valid lifetime is set to 48 hours. Well, then what you can do is an hour before you want to start turning this off, you add a new prefix that has a new desired and valid lifetime that are, that are long and you remove the advertisement of the old prefix. You leave the old prefix on the router, but you take it out of the RA advertisement. Now the host will count down that one hour timer, and in an hour, nobody will be initiating new sessions from that address. 47 hours after that, the valid timer will expire, and everybody will be completely off of that old prefix, and you can deprecate it from the router interface. You've just renumbered an entire statelessly configured subnet and probably nobody even noticed because 47 hours ago they started initiating all their new sessions from that new prefix that you were advertising. And if anybody has a session that lasts more than 48 hours on the internet, realistically when it goes down, are they gonna blame the router or are they gonna assume that the internet did something somewhere sometime in that 48 hours, right? Nobody expects a session to last more than 48 hours. Never seen my search. Well, <laughs> But do you expect them to last more than 48 hours, or are you just pleased that they do? I expect them to last a week. <laughs> when they don't, would you expect that the router was the, the problem, or that you got renumbered, or would you just restart it and not worry about it? Oh, I, I, usually, expect, I usually expect it to my ISP. <laughs> there you go. Okay, if you think IPv6 is hard, wait till you try any of these. These are some of the various methods that people have come up with to try and uh, limp along until they can get to v6. Uh, they're all more complicated than just doing v6. Uh, DHCP v6, any questions about Slack before I move on? Okay, either everybody's asleep or I'm doing a really good job explaining this stuff. I have a question. Yes. You mean subnet masking? It, it hasn't changed. It's just that in general, you want to make everything a slash 64. So that, that's the, the mask that you want on most subnets. Well, but, I, know, I know what a mask looks like on, on IPv4. I've not looked, what does it look like on IPv4? Well, are you, okay, so is everybody familiar with CIDR notation for IPv4 subnet masks? Yeah. The slash N? Okay, in IPv6, we use the same thing. Slash 64 means that 64 bits of network, and as a result, 128 minus 64 is 64 bits of host address. A slash 32 is 32 bits of network and 96 bits of host addresses.
Yes. Well, in order for Slack to work, your subnet has to be a slash 64. So your MAC address is expanded to 64 bits through the method that I told you, the FFFE in the middle, flip the two bit of the first octet. And then the prefix, the 64 bit prefix that the router provides is put together with that MAC address. And that is your IPv6 address for global unicast. Yes. Slash 64. Colon colon 5000 and colon colon 5001 if you want. Or, you know, if you, if you want to be easy to scan, then you can use colon colon 1 and colon colon 2, but there are some DOS attacks that that enables that you may want to avoid. You yes, sir? You can't tell a broadcast panel better if you have a 64 bit then. We don't use broadcasts in V6. No. Okay. There are no broadcasts. You're not going to fill the 64. Your cam table won't support it in your switch. Right. You're not going to put more hosts on a subnet just because you have more addresses. The point here is to do what's called sparse allocation so that you don't have to think about how many hosts am I putting on this subnet. You put the number of hosts on the subnet that makes sense. You still have to think about how many hosts can the switch handle on a subnet. You still have to think about does it make sense to put this many hosts into one routing entity and all of those things. Those considerations don't change. But yeah. Just a follow up. Without the broadcasting or maybe planning fees or something like that, do you well, expect that there could be some sort of relation to, especially with voice applications, where you don't have broadcast capability, but you have to route and go to each particular address in every particular package? No, no, no. We have multicast capability, we just don't have broadcast. Ah. So multicast is still usable, and that's what you should be using for that kind of application anyway. It's just that we don't have the ability to spam the entire subnet with a broadcast packet. Now the reality is we do have a multicast group for all hosts on the subnet. So you can send to the all host broad multicast address, which I can't really tell the difference from a broadcast in terms of the actual number of hosts it hits. But Technically, it is handled as a multicast and not as a broadcast. So, any other questions? Uh, and then in terms of spanning tree, you're actually mixing things up because spanning tree is a layer two thing for negotiating a bridging topology. It has nothing to do with how we do layer three stuff. Um, you have the stuff on the Hurricane Electric code, right? Yeah. And then that guy who wanted point to point, that'll, that'll show him. Yeah, it gives you a, a point to point 64 when you set up your tunnel, exactly. Yeah, Yep. Yeah, but basically you just pick two addresses out of the 64, one for each endpoint, and that's, you know, you, yes, you waste more than 18 quintillion addresses. It's okay. We've got several undecillion to go. For. It'll be okay, really. It's okay to waste addresses in V6, folks. I know that this does not fit with your V4 mentality. It's time to change your mentality. V6 is an area of plenty. It's, it's going to be like the land of opportunity, okay? It's, it's kind of wonderful that way. Yes, sir. Um, this is maybe a slight departure from the uh, enterprise level, but it's for the home user. Yep. I wanted to, uh, you know, it previously was doing NAT or something, and it has a firewall box, and the IP will only give me slash 64. Does that current firewall box into a bridge, or can he still play Well, with first, he should find a different ISP, because that ISP is not implementing v6 correctly. Second, one option he can do is he can get a free tunnel to Hurricane Electric and get a 48 for his house instead of a 64. And by the way, that 48 comes with an additional point to point 64 to route between Hurricane and his, his router. So he gets a 48 behind the firewall. Um, you should be able to get a 48 from your provider. If you can't get a 48 from your provider, pound on them, why not? Um, there's new policy in the air and region designed to kind of help, uh, help with that situation in that providers now get their IPv6 addresses from Aaron on the basis of what's called the provider allocation unit. And the provider allocation unit is whatever the smallest subnet the provider gives to any of its customers. They have to justify all of their customer allocations in terms of those units. So if the provider only gives you a slash 64 and he's got any business customers, he has to justify each and every slash 64 he gives to each business customer. Whereas if he gives you a 48, 
he can give his business customer a 48 no questions asked. So I think this will make it less likely that providers give slash 64s only to residential users. But basically, a provider that's only giving you a 64 doesn't understand IPv6. You're welcome to give them my email address. I will be happy to give them a tutorial. OK, I got to move on because we're, uh, we're already actually towards the end of my time, and I'm about halfway through. DHCP v6, pretty cool. It can assign prefixes other than slash 64, usually intended for prefix delegation. But you can, if you're really determined, do 96s or whatever you really want to do to cause yourself pain. Um, it can assign addresses to hosts, but it cannot provide default router information. Uh, it does have the ability to, to tell your hosts about servers such as DNS, boot file, NTP, et cetera. Stateless AutoConf and DHCP can work together to, to provide a complete set of information. Vendor support still lacking in some areas. Apple just added it in 10.7 um, Lion. So static addressing, same as it ever was in v4. Um, one restriction is that you need to use 000 for the first 12 bits of your v6 suffix in, uh, in a static address. This is to prevent it from colliding with the auto-configured addresses. And by the way, DHCP pools should also adhere to this. So your DHCP pool should, uh, should be within the static range and you should deal with static and DHCP similarly. Privacy addresses are essentially a pathological form of stateless autoconf. Um, they're documented in RFC 3041. They use an MD5 hash with a random component to generate a temporary address. The preferred and valid lifetimes are de derived from the Slack prefix information. Um, they're unfortunately the default in Lion and Vista and later versions of Windows. Uh, they're a bad idea in most situations, but they are useful per for preserving your coffee, your uh, privacy if you're running around to different coffee shops with a mobile laptop or something like that. Multiple addresses per interface. We've learned how to do this in v4. It's even easier in v6. It's the default. In fact, you can't really have a useful v6 implementation with only one address on the interface because you need a link local. And in order to get off the subnet, you need a global unicast. So that's two addresses right there. IPsec in v4 was an add-on feature that kind of got cobbled in afterwards. Uh, in IPv6, IPsec was uh, built in from the ground up. And in fact, the IPsec that we see in v4 today is a feature that was backported from IPv6 development. Um, IPv6, IPsec is a required part of any IPv6 implementation, uh, according to the RFCs. This does not mean that all IPv6 implementations have it, just that they should. Um, you are not required to use it, even though it is required to be there. Uh, but it is considerably easier in IPv6 than it was in v4. And it's a lot cleaner implementation. Configuring IPv6 on native Linux, distro dependent, pretty straightforward. Debioids use uh, Etsy interfaces or Etsy network interfaces. Um, that's a v4 static configuration you've all probably seen. The next line is a v6 static configuration or the next group, I should say. And then that last line is the incredibly complex mechanism necessary to enable autoconf for an interface under Debian. Um, most people should be able to handle iFace, ETH1, INET6, auto. iFace just means interface. ETH1 is the name of the interface. INET6 is the protocol. And auto is just what you'd think it means. Um, Yeah, I'm not going to go down too many of the distro rat holes. Um, interface uh, configuration on a Red Hat variety. Uh, again, v4 static, v6 static. Autoconf, as you can see, is quite easy. IPv6 without a native configuration, without a native connection, you've got three options. Uh, in order of preference, they are 6 in 4, 6 2 4, and Teredo. 6in4 is mostly like GRE, but on a different protocol number. Uh, it's well understood by most people that do networking. It's simple, it's deterministic, it's easy to troubleshoot. There's no anycast magic, which makes debugging a lot easier. Uh, it's controlled by one or two endpoint administrators. Uh, sometimes one administrator manages both endpoints. Um, 
which greatly simplifies debugging because generally you know who each other are and you can get each other on the phone and go, okay, this is what I see, this is what you see, great, this is what we need to fix. Uh, the disadvantage is you actually have to configure it by hand, but it's really not hard to configure. Six to four advantage, automatic configuration. When it works, it's pretty clean, relatively self-optimizing. Probably a good option for certain mobile uh, devices, laptops, cell phones, etc. But when it breaks, it is very hard to troubleshoot and it's very easy to break. Uh, it uses any cast, so it's a completely non-deterministic debugging process. The debugging packet may take a completely different path from the packet that you're having trouble getting through for production. Teredo, all the problems of six to four with additional Microsoft fun. Um, here's how to configure a six in four tunnel on Linux using a route two um, system, which is what's in most of the 2.6 kernels. Um, it is actually supported in the newer Debian config files. The, uh, the slide just hasn't been updated. Um, here are the net tools commands. If anybody's still running a 2.4 kernel, shame on you. Um, here's how you can do it in the Fedora 12 and later config files. Uh, not as easy as you would hope. You need to configure this file and then this other file. And oh, by the way, these other two files. Um, the good news is you can get IPv6 for free. There are a number of tunnel brokers out there offering free IPv6. My personal favorite for obvious reasons is the Hurricane Electric Tunnel Broker at www.tunnelbroker.net. Um, additionally, if you have a presence at a peering point where Hurricane Electric is also uh, there, we are happy to peer with you. Uh, V4 and V6, and we will even give you V6 transit for free across the exchange point. So that's hard to uh, get upset about. Um, routing, the usual suspects. In OSPF, you need to deal with OSPF V3. BGP4 has address family INET6, which is implemented in various ways uh, on different routers, different vendors' routers. Uh, router advertisements are done on Linux through the RADVD application, an unfortunate name, but it does work. Um, and there is full support for V6 in Quagga and some of the other uh, open source routers out there. Uh, in terms of firewalling, IP6 tables looks just like IP tables with funny looking addresses. Okay, this is an actual excerpt from my real system at home running IP6 tables. It is a fully dual stack system. It works just fine. Uh, DNS, forward DNS, just add quad A. Um, it's just like DNS. Uh, except the, the right side of the quad A record is a V6 address instead of a V4 address. Uh, reverse DNS is a little bit more complicated, but not too bad. You have to put all the zeros back in. It is much better if you put the zeros back in before you reverse the address. Trust me on this, I have gone through the exercise both ways. Reversing the address first results in pain. Once you've reversed the address, put a, get rid of the colons, put a dot between every digit, tac.ip6.arpa onto the end and you're done. That is a reverse for 2620 colon 0 colon 930 colon colon 200 colon 2. Um, the other thing you can do is you can say dig minus x and give it the short address. And while you won't get a good answer back from dig, what you will get is the question that dig asked. And that'll contain the reversed form of the address. So let the software do the hard work. Um, Here's how you, you set up a zone file for uh, ip6.arpa. The file name is just my particular naming convention. You can name it Fred if you want. I don't recommend that. In IPv6 reverse zone files, dollar origin is very much your friend. Dollar generate is not. Anybody want to take a guess why you don't want to use dollar generate for a, an IPv6 reverse zone file? How much memory does it take to dollar generate a slash 64? I'm sorry, I did get a hand over there. Okay, yeah, you're, 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 there is not that much disk space in the world to hold the swap file necessary to dollar generate PTR records for a single slash 64, okay? This is not your grandfather's slash 24. It's a big zone file. Um, there's a quad A record, as you can see, mail host, it gets a, an A record, it gets a quad A record, and it's off to the races, dual stacked, happy, happy, joy, joy. Here's an example of how dollar origin saves you a lot of typing for the reverse zone. These are three real host examples that really do exist in my zone file. You're welcome to try them later if you, uh, if you want. Um, I won't need to harp on that. Common reversing mistakes. Uh, 
missing dots, there's a, there's a point where there's two zeros without a dot in between there. Uh, I went cross-eyed on that for about 20 minutes the first time when I made that typo. Um, this is literally what I came up with the first time I reversed an address before I put the zeros in. If you don't think it was painful to uh, try and figure out how I'd screwed that up, guess again. Um, troubleshooting, it's mostly like troubleshooting IPv4. The layer one and layer two stuff doesn't change. Um, common problems, so you can't ping stuff and uh, your neighbors don't show up in ARP. Well, they're not supposed to show up in ARP. No broadcasts, no ARP. IPv6 has a new thing called neighbor discovery. Instead of the all host multicast, uh, instead we use the, the um, selected host multicast uh, address which actually is very nearly going to be unicast in most cases. It uses the last 24 bits of the destination IP address and hosts only have to listen for that. Ping becomes ping six. Um, the equivalent of ARP becomes this IP-FINET6 neighbor show command. Um, I don't know why you need to do so much more typing to do the equivalent of ARP, but you do. Uh, traceroute becomes traceroute six. Uh, on the other hand, Telnet, SSH, WGET, et cetera, they just work. They'll grab the V6 address or the V4 address as appropriate. Yes, sir? I don't know if you talked to anyone about this, but uh, I kind of like using brackets for IPv6 addresses. I don't know. You'd have to talk to the guys that wrote the Traceroute program. Yeah, I, um, cool SSH trick, if you have a dual stack host in the middle and a V4 only host here and a V6 only host there, you can actually connect them for TCP through an SSH tunnel. The dual stack uh, SSH host will take care of doing, doing the, the translation between V4 and V6. Um, this goes into the details of how to do that. Since I'm out of time, I won't dwell on it. Um, staff training, hopefully this is a good start. Uh, you will need more, plan for it, budget for it, allocate time for it, uh, and if possible, take away the electronic leashes before your staff goes into training. It's distracting to the trainer, it's distracting to your staff.